Welcome to Defending Zion, brothers and sisters. This is Blake. Today I would like to talk about the angels of the book of Revelation and Doctrine and Covenants section 88. A lot of people have questions about these angels, uh, whether they're the same angels, uh, what their purposes are, what destructions they cause, and really where these angels fit into the overall timeline of last day events. Now to start out with, I'm going to give you this timeline of the, I call it the angels timeline, right? So this isn't all of the events of the last days, but it gives you some of the key events or key um, reference points to then see where these angels and their work fit into the last days. So the primary time we're looking at is the time between when the seventh seal opens and the beginning of the half hour of silence to the time when Christ appears on the Mount of Olives to the Jews. Now within that we can see a clear delineation between uh, groups of angels and then individual angels that each perform their work in their time and in their place. So first of all we have four angels that carry out their destructions. Then we have the angel in the midst of heaven or, as it's also described, the angel ascending from the east. And then after that, we have the three angels plus Christ. So this is the basic timeline of how it's going to fit in, how the destructions will work. Uh, now, I'm going to go back and forth between Revelation and DNC 88. Those are my two primary sources. So I'd encourage you, study those, and then, you know, as I've done here, Try and fit them together. Look at the wording and the phrases that are used to describe the angels and the destruction that they cause. Those uh, words are essential to helping us identify not only who these angels are, but where they fit in and the, you know they match the, the angels in Revelation with the angels in DNC 88. So to start out with, we're introduced in Revelation 7.1 to the four angels. And John says, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now these uh, four angels that are described here are also the four angels that are mentioned in Revelation 8 verses 7 through 12. And in DNC 77 8 we get a little bit under, uh, greater understanding about these four angels and what we're to understand. Uh, Joseph Smith received the revelation that we're to understand that the four angels are sent forth from God to whom is given power over the four parts of the earth to save life and to destroy. These are they who have the everlasting gospel to commit to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, having power to shut up the heavens to seal up unto life, or to cast down to the regions of darkness. So this scripture teaches us that angels, these four angels, perform both a saving and a sealing function, as well as a destructive function or role. So as we go through these destructions, we also need to realize that we, uh, there will be people that will be sealed from destruction by these angels, right? Um, they're not out just to create havoc and destruction. They are there also to seal and to save. Now in Revelation 7, 2, and 3 we're uh, introduced to another angel ascending from the east. And it says that he has the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, Till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. So I'd encourage you to look at the footnotes for this verse, and as you follow those footnotes, they'll show you that this angel is John the Revelator. And uh, he's also the angel that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. After this, we're introduced to another angel that came and stood at the altar that had a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne 
and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now, if we jump over to DNC 88 verses uh, 89 and 90, again, we see some very similar wording. We see uh, voices of thunderings, voices of lightnings, voice of tempests, and the voice of the waves of the sea heaving themselves beyond their bounds. So this angel is going to perform a great work later on. And by word association and cross-references, we actually can identify who this angel is. And I will identify him later on in the presentation. I also want to point out that these plagues uh, that are in John's Revelations are literal plagues. And uh, when it talks about trumpets, um, this is what Orson Pratt said about it. And the time will come when the seven angels having the seven last trumps will sound their trumps literally, and the sound thereof will be heard among the nations, just preparatory to the coming of the Son of Man. And all the judgments foretold by John, which are to succeed the sound of each of the seven trumpets, which will be fulfilled literally upon the earth in their times and seasons. Okay, so these trumpets will sound literally, and then they will be followed by the judgments and the destructions. Uh, we also learn uh, through Orson Pratt that there is to be a period of time, uh, a space of time between the sounding of each of these trumpets. He said, there are some who suppose when these saints are thus resurrected and taken up into heaven, that this will be the precise period when Jesus will descend on the earth. But I wish to correct this idea by the aid of both old and new revelation. Instead of Jesus immediately descending to the earth, when these saints are thus taken into heaven, he will stay until the seven angels have sounded their trumps. There will be quite a lapse of time between the sounding of each of these seven. Some months will intervene. They do not all follow directly one after the other, or in the course of a few hours' time. But there will be a period between in which certain great and marvelous events will take place. Okay, so let's get into the first uh, four angels. Uh, the first angel, we learn that the destruction in uh, Revelation 8, 7 is hail and fire mingled with blood, and that the third part of trees is burnt up and the green grass is burnt up. Uh, in Revelation 16, 2, uh, the destructions of the first angel are described a little bit differently. Um, it talks about a noisome and grievous sore that falls upon those that have the mark of the beast and that worship the image of the beast. So again, it's, uh, it's a great destruction, but it seems to affect those that uh, align themselves with the beast and have the mark of the beast uh, much more grievously than the rest of the people. If we look over in DNC 88, uh, it's in verses 96 through 98 that we uh, read about what happens after this first angel sounds the trump. And uh, I have a separate video where I'm going to actually go through these few verses and actually talk about uh, how this relates to uh, the resurrection of those that will inherit celestial glory. But uh, suffice it to say here, when the first angel, or after, I should say, the first angel sounds his trumpet, uh, the saints that are alive upon the earth uh, will be transfigured, and they will live to the age of a man before being resurrected. And we can learn that from DNC 63, 49 to 51. Uh, those that have already died will be resurrected first after this trumpet sounds. And the manner in which this celestial resurrection will occur is similar to the way that the resurrection occurred at uh, the time that Christ was resurrected in the meridian of time. And for more understanding of how that occurred, uh, you can go to the Book of Mormon in 3 Nephi 23, or you can go to Matthew 27. But uh, it's important to understand that both of these groups will descend together with Christ when he appears in glory to the whole world at the great and dreadful day. Uh, the second angel uh, 
talks about fire that's cast into the sea, where the third part of the sea becomes blood, and then uh, the third part of the creatures in the sea are die, and uh, third part of the ships are destroyed. So it's a kind of a destruction upon the waters. And it's confirmed again here, the second angel uh, pours out his vial upon the sea. That's in Revelation 16.3. Um, if we go to DNC 88, it's verse 99 that corresponds with this second angel. And when this angel's trump sounds, then cometh the redemption of those who are Christ's at his coming, who have received their part in that prison which is prepared for them, that they might receive the gospel and be judged according to men in the flesh. So uh, this verse in DNC 88 is describing those that will inherit a terrestrial glory. And these people will actually not be resurrected at this time, but they'll be resurrected when Christ comes in his glory to the whole world, or at the great and dreadful day. Uh, the third angel uh, it mentions a star. Uh, the star is wormwood, and again it causes uh, great destruction upon the water. Uh, particularly it makes it to where people uh, die because they drink the water. And uh, again, in Revelation 16, we can see this same destruction uh, that's, uh, that's poured out upon the rivers and the fountains of water. And it's uh, particularly egregious for those that have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. Um, it's the, you know, basically the, the vengeance and fury for uh, destroying those people. And in DNC 88, uh, after this trumpet sound, then come the spirits of men who are to be judged and are found under condemnation. And these are the rest of the dead, and they live not again until the thousand years are ended, neither again until the end of the earth. Uh, so this verse describes those who will inherit a telestial glory. And these people will not be resurrected at this time, but they'll be resurrected at the end of the millennium or at the end of the thousand year period. Uh, the fourth angel's destruction uh, is a destruction basically from the bodies in, in the heavens, the celestial bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars. Uh, there's a lot of darkness. And uh, as, as it relates to the sun, if we go to Revelation 16, um, Somehow this, the sun is going to have power to scorch men with fire and with great heat. And uh, it will be, you know, as the other destructions before it, particularly egregious for those that have blasphemed God. And in DNC 88, when this uh, trump sounds, this is the fourth trump, uh, it, it will say that there are found among those who are to remain until that great and last day even the end, who shall remain filthy still. So this uh, is describing those that remain filthy still after the end of the earth and those that will not inherit a kingdom of glory. These people will be resurrected, but it won't be until the end of the millennium or the end of the thousand year period. Okay, now we have this kind of interlude period where we get this description about the uh, another angel ascending from the east. Uh, as I mentioned before, he's also referred to as another angel flying through the midst of heaven. And we can read about this angel and uh, what he is proclaiming in Revelation 8.13 and Revelation 14.6-7. through 7. It's really a, uh, a warning for the destructions that are going to come after him. Uh, there's three woes that will be pronounced and that will be, um, I guess, destructions that will occur after this angel sound. So this is a, a kind of a last final warning voice uh, to repent so that they aren't destroyed. Now, after this angel proclaims this message, then we have uh, this uh, description of three angels and Christ. And this is in Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20. 
I want to go through each of these verses to kind of give you an understanding of why it's three angels plus Christ. So first of all, Revelation 14:14, 14, 14, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. So who is the Son of Man? If we cross-reference this verse to Moses 6:57 we learn that Jesus Christ is referred to as the Son of Man. And the man of holiness refers to God the Father. So we can see how Jesus Christ is the Son of Man, or the Son of the Man of Holiness. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Okay, so when we talk about the parable of the wheat and the tares, this is the burning of the tares. Um, and if we examine this angel, what makes him unique from the other two angels? He asks Christ to reap the earth. Okay, remember Christ is the one that has the sickle. This angel is the one who signals to Christ that the earth is ripe and ready for destruction. He's also the one that's charged with gathering and sealing people to prevent them from being destroyed. Now we learn in other verses in uh, Doctrine and Covenant 77 and Revelation 7 that John the Revelator has been given the keys to seal the servants of God and that he'll be an instrument to help gather all of scattered Israel. So we can see here that this, this angel here that's asking this is John the Revelator. Now notice also how it's Christ who causes the destruction. Uh, here the angels are merely sounding the trumpet that signals the destruction's coming. This is an important point to understand. It's not necessarily that the angels themselves are causing the destruction. It's it's Christ that's causing the destruction. It's you know it's it's the Father, right? These angels are are just going forth to perform the work. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Okay, so this angel, he also comes out of the temple in heaven, and he also has a sharp sickle. We learn that this is the sixth angel, and we learn this based upon the destructions that he causes later on in verses 19 and 20. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Okay, so this angel is another angel that comes out from the altar, and that has power over fire. Now, do you remember the angel with the golden censer from Revelation 8? That angel also stood at the altar before the throne. And he also commands the previous angel to thrust in his sickle. So if we cross-reference to Revelation 9.13, we find that this specific angel is the seventh angel. Now the altar and the power over fire are going to become very important as we identify the destructions that are caused by the seventh angel later on. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So this angel here that thrusts in his sickle is the angel from verse 17. It's the sixth angel that thrusts in his sickle to destroy the remaining wicked who are fully ripe for destruction. We know that this destruction takes place without the city. Now we have to ask ourselves, which city? It would be Jerusalem. So that's why we can place this destruction alongside the destruction that takes place after the sixth angel blows his trumpet and before the seventh angel blows his trumpet and then Christ appears on the Mount of Olives. So again, that kind of helps us to put together this timeline and where these angels fit. So, the fifth angel, as I mentioned, is John the Revelator. 
He's also described as the first woe. I'm not going to go into detail about this particular destruction, um, but it's you know it's a particularly deadly destruction uh, where people are bitten and tormented for five months. So again, by looking at this, we can see obviously this means that there's time between the blowing of the trumpets because it says there's a five month period where these people are tormented. And in Revelation 16, uh, again, the destructions and the consequences match up perfectly with those that are described previously in uh, Revelation chapter 8 and 9. Uh, now, in DNC 88, when this trumpet sounds, which is the fifth trumpet and which is the fifth angel, um, we also learn that this angel is the one who committeth the everlasting gospel, flying through the midst of heaven unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. And we see that this message is the exact same message that John, the revelator, said this angel would proclaim. It's not word for word, but it's, it's, it matches very nicely with it. Now, the sixth angel. As I've studied this, I, I honestly, I can't identify... Uh, who this is. Um, if you have an idea about that, I'd appreciate you sending me an email and uh, and uh, we can take a second look at it. But uh, needless to say, this angel sounds the trumpet and then uh, there's going to be a mass slaughter, basically. There's, there's armies of the Gentiles, huge armies, right? And a third part of these men are going to be killed by fire, by smoke, and by brimstone. Um, uh, so it's a huge destruction that takes place. Um, the sixth angel, um, we also learn that it has something to do with the river Euphrates. So we kind of understand where this is taking place, right? It's kind of setting our minds to, okay, it's going to be in this area. Um, it also... You know, this is, like I said, it's a huge army. And if we think of it only in terms of like a mortal, uh, only those that are going to be living on the earth, I think we're, we're kind of narrowing what John really saw. Because when he describes these unclean spirits that come out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast, these are a greater army that are uh, spirits of devils, right? I, and I talked about this in my... Revelation 13 video. So if you want to understand that better, go and watch that. But needless to say, this is going to be a massive army, and it's not just a mortal army. It's everybody that's gathered together. And um, all of these armies gather together against uh, God's people and against the Jews in Armageddon. And this angel, when he blows the trumpet, he proclaims that Babylon has fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And in DNC 88, the same message is proclaimed by this angel after he sounds the trump. Um, it's talking about Babylon, um, that Babylon has fallen. Now the seventh angel we can identify as Michael or Adam, and he's the third woe. Now, we uh, are introduced to Adam first in Revelation 10, verses 1 through 3. Uh, this is where a mighty angel comes down from heaven. He's clothed with a cloud and a rainbow upon his head, and his face as were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And then, you know, Adam, he has this book open, right? And he stands upon the earth, and then he cries a loud cry or with a loud voice as if a lion roareth and then the seven thunders utter their voices now if we cross-reference these verses to dnc 88 verses 110 through 112 this is that's really where we learned that this angel is adam or michael and the destruction that 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 michael or adam causes at this time is basically uh, huge destructions. So there's lightnings, there's voices, there's thunderings, there's earthquake, an earthquake, um, which is the earthquake that will happen when Christ sets his foot upon the Mount of Olives. And we also learn about a great hail. 
and uh, the hail is described. And these are massive stones that fall out of heaven and destroy those that fight against God. And again, this is the you know if we if we look at the destructions that this that Michael causes, and then we go back and we compare him to the angel with the golden censer, I think visually it makes sense to to connect um, the seventh angel, Michael or Adam, as the angel with the golden censer. That it's he's the same angel, right? And think about what that angel with the golden censer did. He took fire from the altar. That corresponds really well, if you think about like a hot coal, that corresponds really well with a great hail and fire coming from heaven. Um, it's just something kind of visually that I've noticed about that, uh, that kind of helped piece all this together. And in DNC 88, after Adam or Michael sounds his trump, uh, he will proclaim, it is finished, it is finished. The Lamb of God hath overcome and trodden the winepress alone, even the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Um, if we cross-reference this scripture to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, uh, we get a second confirmation that this angel is Michael or Adam. After the seventh angel, after Adam and uh, blows the trumpet and the destructions occur, and Christ sets his foot upon the Mount of Olives. Then we have a second sounding of the trumpets. And this is what Orson Pratt said about that. He said, according to the revelation from which I have read, the second sounding of the trumpets is not to prudence destruction among the nations, but the sound of the first one will reveal the secret acts of God, his purposes and doings on the earth during the first thousand years. The sounding of the second will reveal the doings and purposes of the great Jehovah during the second thousand years, and so on, until the seventh shall sound the second time, and pronounce the work of God finished, so far as the great preparation needful for his second coming is concerned. So, preparation for the great and dreadful day. Notice now that it is the first sounding of the first of these seven, when the first resurrection takes place. And all these great works are to be performed on the earth, and years elapse before Jesus descends with all his saints. That is, if we understand these things correctly, by what little is revealed upon this subject. So notice here this second paragraph. Uh, Orson Pratt confirms that it, uh, the first sounding of the first trumpet is when the first resurrection takes place, or the celestial resurrection. Um, so this is just another witness of when this resurrection will occur or, um, or those that will uh, be caught up to heaven that are then living on the earth. So here is a very sad looking um, attempt at a timeline of these uh, angels, their destructions and the events. So we start out on the bottom left here where the seventh seal opens and the half hour of silence begins. Then we have the four angels who sound their trumps and pour out destructions. And along with those first four angels uh, are, a, a, I guess, a beginning of the celestial resurrection. And then a, a, a proclaiming of when the other resurrections will take place in the future. Then we have another angel ascending from the east after which the fifth and the sixth angels sound their trumps and then pour out their destructions. Then we have the seventh angel, who is Michael, or Adam, who sounds his trump and pours out his destructions, at which point Christ will then appear on the Mount of Olives. And sometime shortly after those trumps are sounded, the seven angels will again sound their trumps and proclaim uh, the secret works of God and all the acts of men. Um, in each of the 7,000 years of the Earth's temporal existence. Um, this is, if you remember the phrase in Scripture where it talks about uh, people's sins being proclaimed upon the housetops, I think this matches that uh, particular Scripture very well. Because this is something that where everybody's going to hear everything that happened that wasn't repented of. Um, so after these angels sound their trumpet, then the half hour of silence ends. 
and then Christ appears in glory to the entire world. So I hope this has given you some understanding about the angels and and how the angels in Revelation connect with the angels in Doctrine and Covenants 88. Um, I testify, brothers and sisters, that we need to be prepared for this. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a time that will be scary for those that have not prepared and that have not repented and kept their covenants. Those that are not worthy of a celestial resurrection. So I pray, brothers and sisters, you'll make yourself worthy of that by doing all you can to hear our Father in heaven, to listen to his voice and to receive the revelation you need and make the changes that you need so that you'll be prepared. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.